Does character always win? With past guest author Warren Berger, who writes books about beautiful questions we might ask, is that is that a beautiful question? Does character always win? Well, it's an ambitious question, at least. But what is character? And assuming we can find an acceptable definition this week, how can we find good character in ourselves and others? How might we score that if we even should try? And how do we grow our own character toward a better world for ourselves and others? Well, we have a most worthy guest, a Beatrice, for our visit into the underworld and out as we dig deeper toward understanding this week what good character is, how it can benefit you as a human being, as a business owner, probably even as an investor to character, good or bad, runs all through investing, business, and life. So let's talk about it. Let's learn. Only on this week's Rule Breaker Investing. It's the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast with Motley Fool co-founder David Gardner. Before we start this week, I want to thank my daughter, Kate Gardner, who got to spend a few days a couple of years ago in and around Ed Brooks and his Oxford Character Project. Kate came back to the U.S. effusively praising the man you will meet today and his work. So I want to thank Kate, who, among her many virtues, has a remarkably good eye, remarkably good discernment in finding people and ideas of value and connecting with them and connecting others to them. Thanks, Kate. Dr. Edward Brooks is executive director of the Oxford Character Project. His research is currently focused on virtue ethics, hope, and character and leadership development. Particular interests include the relationship between character and culture in business, leadership for human flourishing, and leadership development in universities and businesses. Ed leads a major multi-million dollar interdisciplinary research project funded by the John Templeton Foundation on culture, character, and leadership. These are all words that I dearly love. Focusing on the sectors of, that's another good word, technology, finance, law, and business. Ed, a delight to have you on Rule Breaker Investing. Thanks, David. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Ed, first things first, tell us a little bit about your childhood. What kind of family did you grow up in? And and what was a moment in the younger Ed Brooks's life that may have put him on the path to the work he does today? Well, thanks, Dave. And I love this question. So I, I grew up as the second of four children. Dad worked at IBM and then became uh, an entrepreneur. Mum was a primary school teacher. We lived in a village called Gerrard's Cross, which is built at a crossroads on the old main road. Uh, between Oxford and London, and it was a great place to grow up. Um, my first job was the local paper round. My second job was a waiter at the old inn called the Bull Hotel, and I played lots of sport, especially rugby, which I would practice for for hours and hours in the garden. And that perhaps is the um, the anecdote that I might share in terms of something from my earlier days that prefigures maybe what I'm doing now. So I I don't know how much you know about rugby, but the position I played was called hooker. And one of the key skills, if you play that position, is throwing the ball into what's called the line-out when when the ball goes out of play. And you throw it overhead, um, like an American football pass, and to a member of your team who's lifted up to catch it. So it's a kind of target practice thing. And I would practice this skill for hours and hours, throwing the ball against the flat wall at the back of our house, and my dad put up this board and I'd try and hit the board. Uh, sometimes um, I'd hit it, sometimes I'd miss, and occasionally it would hit the window. Um, and you can imagine how <laughs> uh, annoying this was for, for everyone in the house. I've, I've <laughs> since um, heard the noise that it, that it makes from within. But I used to do this for, for hours and hours and hours. And what I was learning at the time was that intentional practice paves the way for growth. And, and that, that does. And I got better and better at this skill as I practiced. Um, I wasn't particularly um, talented, but I um, I was really passionate, and I I put my heart into it. I became captain of my school team. Um, we did quite well and made the the national finals. I played at university, but what I really developed in, in those days, I think, was a disposition of persistent effort and endurance that then translated to a whole bunch of different areas. So I was building character with a kind of have a go, keep going approach to life. And um, I think that has prefigured what I'm doing now, which is all about this idea of character and character development, thinking about 
how to um, and strategies to develop character and enable others to to do that as well in across their life in, in different di- domains as well. I always love hearing the superhero origin story. That's always the best movie of the inevitable several that will come from any good superhero is the first one. Most of us enjoy hearing how that person became that person. So I want to dig in a little bit more there. Ed, did you learn more about the world from newspaper delivery or waiting tables? Oh, a, a, a bit of both. Newspaper delivery was was good because it was always the newspaper I delivered was uh, the local one, which went out Friday evening after school. And I'd come back home from school and delivering the local newspaper was the last thing I wanted. Um, but to do sometimes, especially <laughs> through the winter, you can imagine. So I think that taught me some kind of self-discipline and um, um, kind of endurance to, to get out there. And I was given a kind of firm push from uh, from mum back home. So I learned a lot from that. And then the uh, experience of, of waiting tables was uh, was a good one of uh, kind of working together with others and taking care, taking care to to serve the uh, the food appropriately onto the plate rather than to the lap and uh, similar similar things which I learned sometimes from trial and error. But uh, learn learn from both, and I think that's something um, which um, is really important in, in in developing who we are is, is is thinking about the context, going through life, learning, taking these learning experiences reflectively, and. Um, yeah, mm. making mistakes, learning, developing, growing. Much agreed. Ed, here in the United States of America, as I know you're aware, you've traveled um, widely. You've been to our country before. We tip typically for uh, our waiters. Uh, and we're being asked to tip in lots of different ways. Often I'll just buy something at the five and dime store and they'll flip around uh, the monitor and give me an opportunity to tip 10% just for the candy bar that I just bought. There are lots of <laughs> opportunities to tip. Were you tipped as a waiter do back in that day, or is it still the same today? What, what could one expect waiting tables? So I used to serve at a lot of um, functions, weddings and, and so on. And there, there wasn't so much of, of the kind of tipping culture. But in any case, I think I, certainly we don't have the same generosity towards um, hospitality staff in the UK as I think you do over on, on your side of the Atlantic. Well, it's kind of called that generosity. It almost feels like compulsion in some ways. That's at its worst. But I do think that a tipping culture is generally probably a kinder culture as long as they're tips, not bribes, which happens a lot across this world. (laughs) Let me ask you one more thing about your childhood. What was it like having your father working at IBM, Uh, this big behemoth company started in America? Did that open up your eyes to either business or the world at large? It opened up my eyes to these amazing things called computers. So my father was was right there working with um, the mainframe computers and could bring bits of tech um, home with him, which was so exciting, and going and seeing him in the office. But he left IBM actually when I was still fairly young um, to take some technology which he'd been developing and to develop that in a tech startup, um, which he is still still running these days. So that was mostly as I was growing wow. up, my father kind of growing growing his own company, and um, yeah, I admire him for doing that. That's wonderful. Yes, you did mention he translated that into entrepreneurship, which continues. Ed Brooks, what is the Oxford Character Project? So the Oxford Character Project is a research project at the University of Oxford that focuses on the human dynamics of leadership and the qualities of character that enable leaders to build trust, to think with clarity, to remain open to opportunity, to contribute to society, to persevere through difficult times. These qualities of intellectual and moral character that enable us to become wise thinkers and good leaders. And we have researchers focusing on different aspects of character and leadership and designing and delivering programs, educational programs for students at Oxford in other universities around the world and for executives from a range of of companies and sectors. Hearing you describe that, I wonder, I'm, I'm left to wonder, shouldn't this be at every school or, or are we expecting families to do this? Uh, and maybe things are happening at every school. You, I think of you as working within one of the fantastic institutions of higher learning in the world today. Um, a lot of character formation starts for when we're young kids. So it's interesting to me even uh, that you're working on people's characters. They come in as, as adults because I thought our character was already fixed, let's say, when I show up on campus at Oxford University. 
How many peer institutions do you have? Is it quite common what you're doing or is it uncommon? And what can we learn from that? Great question. Historically, it was very uh, common. So roll back 100 or 150 years and character was um, right at the heart of what university education was intended to be about. And um, the liberal arts education was really focused on this idea of formation. But I think through the 20th century, um, for various reasons, that uh, focus turned to more technical um, skills, which hmm. um, are very, very important as well. And this technical education, scientific education um, developed and a focus on universities uh, more closely attached to a kind of direct um, aspects of the economy, perhaps. And the idea of, of character development in universities became less prevalent. I think the um, aspiration was never entirely left behind, but it certainly became more difficult through the um, 20th century to think about what it might look like, especially with this focus on universities needing to be uh, training schools for, um, for science and technology uh, and for economic progress, but also because the underlying traditions maybe that had held, held up character education in universities fell away and we became more plural. Um, as uh, societies in the West. And so the idea of developing character perhaps came, uh, became more difficult. And so we're really picking up this story um, now in the, in the 21st century when there's been a revival of character education in earlier years. Um, there was a turn in um, moral philosophy towards an idea of ethics called virtue ethics, which is an ethics that focuses on uh, character and virtue. And we can come back to that in, in a bit perhaps. Um, but... Um, that um, came into education, to schools increasingly. And you rightly say, much character is developed in those earlier years in family contexts in uh, junior and, and high school. But character is always developing. Uh, we're always growing. We're shaped by the people um, around us, by the places we inhabit, by the stories that we tell. Um, I dare say that in every company, maybe even the Motley Fool, people are shaped by the way things are done and by the people that they spend the most, uh, most time with. Um, and so we're thinking about what that means intentionally then for university education. And universities are coming back to this idea. It's been very interesting. This last week, the um, Times Higher, Educa Higher Education University rankings went, uh, went out. And I went through the top 15 universities there looking at their educational mission statements. And it was interesting to see where characters mentioned and profiled. And it's profiled in several of these educational mission statements at Princeton. At uh, MIT, really interestingly, where there's a real emphasis on, on character. They talk about technical education, yes, but also liberal education to develop character. And that's important in a world of complexity where things are changing all the time to develop the personal qualities which can enable you to navigate this kind of world really well. It occurs to me that we're bandying about back and forth the word character and perhaps because many of us come from different cultures. Many listening are not United States citizens, but citizens of the world. Maybe not everybody has the same thought or definition of the word character. I don't know if this is a little bit too nakedly bold of me, Ed, but could you define character, please? I'd love to, David. And um, of course, with any of these big concepts, hard to define, they're so multifaceted. But character um, um, it's actually an old idea and a very old word. So the etymology comes from ancient Greece, where character meant mark or imprint. And you might think of the imprint of a profile of a ruler on a coin. And uh, we still have this idea of character as imprint, of course. Think of the 280 characters that there you imprint in your X or Twitter um, post. What we're talking about, though, is personal character. And here we're talking about then the moral and intellectual marks or qualities that are deeply imprinted on a person. Um, and we can think about character in this way then as, as a constellation of dispositions or habits that shape the way that we characteristically think, feel, and act. And character um, is stable across contexts. So we expect, if you think of someone as having a certain character, we expect them to show up uh, consistently in a certain kind of way. But it's not static. And this is really important. Character can be developed and is developed certainly at some times of life more uh, than others, but it's developed across the whole life course. That was a beautiful definition. Thank you, Ed Brooks. Coming from you, that means a lot. I earlier asked you, what is the Oxford Character Project? We're going to talk more about it, a little bit more of the dynamics when you started it, why a little bit of that. But before I ask those things, 
What is the Oxford Character Project not? The Oxford Character Project is not about turning the clock back to some period of history when um, people were <laughs> this kind of ideal types, you know, these people of good character who used to walk around always and everything was, uh, was all good in the world. That's never existed. And it's not about <laughs> telling people who they should be or placing burdens on individual students or, or any others. What it is about is helping people to become the best versions of themselves in all of the different domains of their life and to contribute to the good of society uh, wherever they find themselves in the world. That sounds like something I'd like to sign up for. I enjoyed my university education and I esteem my university, which at a national level is a public institution. The University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill has a pretty good reputation, but I will say I missed that. I missed that, that focus. I don't think most of us going through education at any level today, frankly, expects or gets that, although some of the best schools do provide it. And, uh, and yours is obviously one through the Oxford Character Project. Ed, could you describe for me a little bit the dynamics of the project today? When did you start it? Why did you start it? Who are you working with? Love to learn a little bit more there. So we're now going into our 10th year, which is um, exciting to, to think about from my perspective. We started in 2014 as a group of professors. We're thinking about the changing nature of the university. Uh, with growing numbers of students, particularly taking master's courses and coming wonderfully from right around the world. And thinking about what the Oxford offer was when it came to education. And this university, like many other universities, talks proudly of developing uh, leaders for the future. And there was a particular professor called Donald Hay, who was the founding head of the social sciences division here at Oxford. And he said, yes, of course, well, Oxford produces thinkers and leaders. We all know that. But does the University of Oxford produce wise thinkers and good leaders? And what are we doing to um, make sure that that is the case? That is a beautiful question. I'm so glad that you you all thought to ask that. Ed, were you bringing that question? Did it arise naturally from the state of Oxford in 2014? I'm just fascinated that that question would be asked. So the, the, the backstory was um, like a, more broadly around the world post-financial crash and certainly in UK society, really emerging questions around the leadership crisis, which were a prevalent at the time. And in many ways, these questions have continued since, but certainly here in the UK, there was a lot of visibility here. Um, what are the leaders doing in financial services? But then what are the leaders doing in politics? There was an expenses scandal. What are the leaders doing in the military? And there was a scandal around a treatment of prisoners. And you could pretty much go across every sector. And there was uh, a sense that, hmm, Maybe the, the, the people who are leading the way in, in these sectors aren't um, perhaps leading in ways that we might, we might like. Um, or certainly increased visibility on, on that, whether there was you know, a marked decline in reality or not. There was certainly a lot more focus on that, on that question in, in the wake of a few prominent um, events and, and scandals. And this really then turned the question to, well, many of these students are coming through top universities. Many of them come from this university in the political um, world, certainly here in the UK and beyond. And what is our education doing here then to contribute positively to the kind of vision of good leadership, which can uh, enable um, work in these various different areas of society to, to go forward well for everyone's benefit? Ten years in, Ed, what are some of the partnerships that you have today? What are some of the dynamics of running the project? So partnership's been at the heart of our work wonderfully, David. So we started with a very small team and started to work with students to explore some of these questions in partnership with them. What were the aspirations of these wonderful um, graduate students that we have here? And we focus particularly on the graduate student population coming from around the world. How did they understand what good leadership was and the character qualities they wanted to develop to fulfill their aspiration to affect change, to lead well in different places and in different um in different sectors of society. So we started to work with these students and, and we, we went uh, far there thinking, okay, well, let's work together and think about a vision of good leadership and how that might be possible to develop during your time at, at university, clarify and grow. And we work with others um, as well from um, across other universities and um, around the world. There's some wonderful work at Wake Forest University and Christian Professor Christian Miller is a moral a philosopher there at um, Wake Forest University. He'd been doing some brilliant work uh, when it came to the philosophical components of character, we drew heavily on uh, his work there. And that work has wonderfully expanded at uh, Wake Forest, an early postdoctoral uh, fellow here, 
um, who's a great friend called Michael Lamb, then went across to Wake Forest and now leads the program for leadership and character at that wonderful university in Winston-Salem. And their, their work has, has expanded rapidly and we've learned a lot from the work that, that they're doing. We've established partnerships with other universities, the University of Hong Kong. I'm heading there next week, actually, to, to work with them and their character um, and leadership program um, at the LSE here in the UK and, uh, and many others also. And then partnerships with others in, in different sectors. So we were aware after the first uh, focus on higher education that we really needed to be thinking beyond the walls of the university in a much more intentional way. And that's where the business focus came from. Um, of course, it's great to think about how students can develop at their time at university, but what are they developing for? Well, careers and lives that are lived well beyond the walls of the university. What was happening there when it came to character uh, development, leadership development? How did that relate to organizational cultures in different sectors? And so we established partnerships. I think we've worked with 51 different businesses um, in these sectors of finance, law and technology um, in particular over the last three years in order to try to understand, okay, what's the picture there and, and how does it relate to our understandings of character and character development we've been thinking about in higher education? How might that um, be transposed to organizational context? And it occurs to me you've, you've developed and delivered character and leadership development programs for universities and businesses around the world, as you just said. So that means to me, you're a designer. So I'm fascinated by design, by the makers. What are a few thoughts or techniques that you work into your programs that can help us learn more about design from you? Well, I love this focus on design, and um, I've thought about it a little bit as well in relation to character, and I was prompted to do so by um, a meeting with um, a chap called Dave Evans, who's a professor at Stanford University, along with Bill Burnett, who um, leads the design school in the School of Engineering at Stanford. I think Bill Burnett and Dave Evans have applied design principles to character with a program and then a book called Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived, Joyful Life. What a great, great title. And so I met Dave and he started talking about, um, about how they were using design principles to help students at Stanford think about what it meant to, to, live, uh, to live well and to grow personally and had some great advice, particularly has stuck with me is the idea of prototyping rather than getting hung up on identifying one perfect path, um, the idea of embracing and prototyping, taking action, learning, growing. And, and that stuck with me strongly. But as we've focused here, I think there are three ways that we've tried to design or think about design principles when it comes to our work. The first is to focus on what and especially who we're designing for. So if design is about utility in, in some way, thinking about the people we're designing for and what the program is trying to, to do and affect and uh, to mm. consider people holistically, uh, not just in terms of the intellectual content we might pass on to them, but what are their stories, their experience, their emotions? How are they engaging with what we're doing? And so designing very much with the students um, in mind. Um, secondly, remaining open to surprise in educational uh, programs that we deliver. So, yes, having a plan. And the, the idea of a program kind of suggests something of this. You know, but the program can seem maybe at times as well too packaged, too box and always being open to surprise even if we've done something a lot of times every time is going to be different what are these uh, this what's this group going to uh, to bring with them and so having that openness to adapt and thinking about design here is intention yes but iteration and that's the prototyping idea perhaps so that's the second remain open to surprise and the third um has been to keep learning because design is never done and it's amazing how you find it but thinking about um designs which were once cutting edge and you look back at them 10 years later and you can't imagine when you see it at the time, thinking that they could be anything more up to date, and then you look back after ten years, and it looks um, looks ten <laughs> years looks ten years old. Design is never done. Well, I really appreciate all three of those and design thinking and remain open to surprise is probably my favorite of the three. What a wonderful thing uh, every human being should do and be ready for over the course of our lives. So it's great to hear you exemplifying that in your design principles, and as you run the project and work with, yes, your answer number one, work with, in this case, your I would call it your customer or your student, the person that you're working with, your client, and being client focused. Ed, let's move on to three big questions. This is really how we've organized our, our conversation. I don't even know how this is going to ensue. I just know what we purpose at the beginning, like any good adventure. So we we talked about this in the weeks leading up to this interview. And you suggested these three 
topics. We're going to cover each of them in this order. The first is, does character always win? The second is, how do we keep score in and around character? And the third is, how can I, you, we up our game? How can we grow in character? So I consider each of these a conversation. Each of these three could easily spin a, a full hour of rich discussion. And perhaps we'll have an opportunity in future to go deeper. But let's keep it medium to light. Let's not spend too long on any of these, but let's give a good 10 minutes or so thought, focused thought, with your help, Ed Brooks, for speaking to these three topics. So the first one is, does character always win? Now, I read a wickedly good small book called Integrity. It was written in 2009 by Henry Cloud, a U.S. writer who operates out of California. You may have seen his stuff before. And I thought I remembered this line. So I went back, I repurchased the ebook Kindle version of this book. I'd only had it in hard copy, but I misplaced it. And so I, I searched back to see if, in fact, he wrote this phrase in the book character always wins. And I checked, and he did. And I've always remembered it 15 years later. And I've kind of lived my life by this belief that you always win with character. Now, did you win the game? Maybe not. Did you win the contract? Maybe not. But you you win. You don't lose with character. So this might be the throwback to the previous centuries, this chivalric thing that never actually existed that I think that character always wins. But I've been persuaded by that. So that's the compelling question I wanted to lead off with, Ed, without short-circuiting the conversation, because please don't give a blunt answer to this. Does character always win? Well, academics don't like giving blunt answers. We love to caveat. But <laughs> I, I will say up front that I think it does in the long term. Yes, character, character wins. And it's the most important key to winning in life. But uh, we need to spend a bit of time going a bit deeper to get beyond the, uh, the superficial answer here, I think. I think first, perhaps, to clarify that we're talking about good character, um, which um, is important to clarify. So mm -hmm. good character, qualities like justice, courage, integrity, uh, you mentioned. But of course, character is not all, all good. We're talking about the dispositions that shape how we think, feel, and act. Those are positive. Positive character qualities um, are called virtues. Uh, negative character qualities exist as well, and they're called vices. And there's a way, I guess, to think about winning by being selfish, greedy, arrogant. These are vices. And we're not talking about uh, winning by those means. We're thinking about good character. And does um, good character, justice, courage, integrity, and so forth, always, always win? And, and I think the, uh, the answer here comes down to how we define the, the win and the um, time horizon that we have in mind. Uh, I think winning anything really worthwhile, in a sense, relies on the qualities of character. And um, we might pursue that line a bit more. But at the end of the day, actually, the qualities of character transform the meaning of the win in the long term. And that's why we can say that character, mm. character always wins, because once that transformation of the idea of winning has taken place, the horizon's extended. And there's a, a future to go after, which is um, all about what Aristotle talked about as happiness, which is attained by actions in accord with virtue. I really appreciate that definition. I think I missed that. I may have skipped that class in Aristotle at university, but I love the line and it makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, what, and I appreciate the, the distinction you're making between good character and bad character, because it's a little bit too blithe, a little bit too glib to just say character always wins. So we're already getting into some nuance here. You're already deepening our thinking. Ed, when you think about character and how it relates to performance, why are you persuaded that in the long term, character wins? What is the difference between short term performance and long term performance as we think about good character? So I think the, the thing about short and long term performance is that character isn't developed in an instant and it's not developed for the moment either. Uh, the development of character points us beyond the uh, instantaneous and the um, kind of short term success, the quick win, um, and it points us towards the, the long term gain. Now, quick wins are important. Uh, they're important in, in life. And we live for the moments when we feel good and we sip our coffee and get the 
um, the, the, the shot of caffeine, which enlivens us. This is a, a quick win. And quick wins are important in business as well. Of course, they are. We need to keep moving forward. And if we don't do that and we think, oh, no, it's all about the, the long run and ignore the quick wins sometimes, then uh, we won't get very far. But of course, you can do the opposite as well. And maybe that's been a, a move in, in culture to think more about the, the short term gains than the, the long run. And here we are having to perhaps re, rebalance and character can enable us to do that. So character can help for the quick win. And here we might think about character qualities like uh, resilience or hard work or passion, energy. Um, these character qualities that enable us to get things done that we need to get done uh, now and to do that to a, to, a, to a good standard. But we might think as well about uh, character qualities which can deliver over the longer term, maybe relational character qualities, generosity, um, justice, uh, wisdom, of course. And I think that's important, certainly, as we think over the, the long term to bring balance and good judgment. Hope's going to be important too. Uh, and these can then take us beyond the short-term horizon. So both of these are important, the short-term performance and the long run. Um, but if we just focus on the short, we miss out on actually where is this all going and um, character can help to uh, refocus our horizons to a, a bigger and um, yeah, more beautiful picture perhaps. And virtues such as they are as opposed to vices, virtues, the focus of our conversation. Um, I'm curious, have you enumerated the virtues? Do you have a list? Is there a number? Um, and maybe even more importantly, because it's probably infinite if we just keep thinking about it forever, I'm not sure, but have you rated and ranked them at all? Now, I'm not trying to get into our scoring section yet. That's going to come a little bit later, but I'm just curious whether you've enumerated and or rated ranked. This is a great question. It's a really controversial one um, in philosophy and virtue ethics. The enumeration of the virtues is there uh, one list, and there are many, as it's related to different um, um, aspects of life and existence. In the classical world, famously, there were four virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Uh, in the Western um, tradition, those then were supplemented by three more uh, virtues um, of faith, hope, and love, as uh, Christian theology met classical philosophy and so there became seven but um, while these have been um, prominent many philosophers have many bigger lists aristotle um, has many many more um, virtues than um, than that and many since as well have said no actually it's not not possible to restrict the list and um, there are different virtues needed for different um, aspects of life one of the papers i'm working on at the moment actually is to do a review of people who are working on character and leadership and reviewing the models which people have developed, saying these are the virtues which are really important for leadership. And there are various different approaches here. And to, uh, to see what we make of that and see if there's a way to think about the virtues that we can say, actually, that these virtues are important for leadership. I do wonder whether it's more about understanding the kinds of aspects of the task at hand, aspects of the situation, um, and then the function needed. And then Mm. And using wisdom to discern actually what are the most important virtues here rather than having an absolute list. And this perhaps comes back to what virtues are. Virtues are excellences of function, um, which really is to say they're actually all about performance. Uh, virtues are about performance, but performance, um, good performance of the kind of thing that you are in accord with your function. So a kind of classic example is the kind of steak knife example. The function of a steak knife is to cut through you know, your 12 ounce sirloin steak and its sharpness, you know, it's sharper than a standard table knife, its weight, it's heavier than a standard table knife. These are virtues. It's certain sharpness, it's certain weight. These are excellences that enable it to be the best at performing its function. And vices are the things that might prevent it from performing its function. So, so a steak knife that's blunt or a bit flexible or really light um, isn't going to be able to perform very, very well. And what we're thinking about as we think about character and, and virtues, are, are there particular um, aspects here relating to human performance that we can, uh, we can list? What does it mean to perform well as a human being, either overall or in some specific domain, um, such as investing or sport or in, um, in leadership in politics? Ed, you sent me over a white paper that the project has produced in the last month or so. It's entitled Good Leadership in UK Business. Now, 
Uh, the WAG would immediately want to ask, is there good leadership in UK business? Uh, not trying to be too American, too blunt, but I'll, I'm curious as to what you discovered when you conducted your survey of good leadership in UK business. But I also just want to share a quick tidbit that I picked up from the paper itself. And I'm going to quote, quote, kindness, creativity, and humility are widely considered important for good leadership, but were rated by participants among the five least central features. So talk broadly about the report. Talk more specifically about what that insight conveys. So the report um, was a piece of descriptive research. That is to say, we asked people about their perceptions of what good leadership looks like in UK business using a method called prototype analysis, which tries to identify the central prototype, if you like, the, the key idea of good leadership that is held by people across um, business sectors. And we um, here involved over 1,100 participants in um, the uh, surveys, two rounds of, of surveying following this method. And they came back with 84 different features which were generated by these participants. Then other participants then ranked according to their centrality in order to help us understand well, what do people think good leadership looks like. And there were some um, interesting um, findings from this research. The first one, and it um, plays into what we're talking about about character, was that most of the features that were listed by employees in UK firms related to character, I think some 52% were character qualities, personal character qualities. Uh, the other categories we looked at, interpersonal skills, they're important as well. Leadership is interpersonal and 35% relates to that. And 13% were related to professional competence aspects such as risk awareness or strategy um, or technical expertise. Um, but this focus on character came, came through and this was uh, generated by the participants. So uh, striking and striking maybe particularly given that much leadership development focuses on competence, maybe focuses on interpersonal skills, maybe doesn't focus as much on character development. So I think certainly there's something mm. to, be, um, to be taken away there. But there were also surprises, like you say, in terms of what wasn't rated very highly. So yes, um, there's some good research talking about the importance of humility in leadership. And certainly I, I'm surprised by kindness featuring low down because it seems to me that this is um, essential. And certainly there's, there's good uh, examples of people who are held up for their kindness in leadership in, um, in different domains. And you might think about the importance of um, creating a positive corporate culture if the people who are leading in the organization um, aren't kind don't take account of the humanity of those around them no names of others seek to encourage them find out about them um go out of their way to support them in uh, in different ways then the culture of the company is not going to be built um in a way which is um, particularly robust or effective i would say so it was surprising that some of these features which are considered quite highly in a research that's been done uh, were were there lower down and certainly something perhaps to play to play back to um to, to companies as we're talking now to them and saying, well, how does this reflect the way that you see leadership in, in your firm? And maybe in so, some senses, maybe it could be table stakes. Maybe the expectation these days is that operating at a high level, you would be bringing kindness for your fellow human being. You would be bringing some measure of humility, not arrogance. And so maybe they're less interesting because they're more expected. I don't actually know. Uh, I didn't do the descriptive research. I think that's true. And, and this is one of the challenges of the descriptive method we used is that we were surveying people rather than interviewing them here. So it was more quantitative than qualitative. And we need to go back and ask people a little bit more to get the story there. Personally, I think that even if it is something which is assumed, there's a danger in that, however, because if we um, start to assume what's really very, very important, then I guess we're not putting the effort and energy into developing or ongoing cultivating it in an ongoing way and character qualities are like muscles that they develop as they're practiced and they can atrophy if they're uh, if they're not practiced and uh, not used as well agreed kindness creativity and humility not ranking as high what did rank high of course a lot of business people are listening right now a lot of investors people who work in and around well really all of the professions but we think a lot about investing in finance here um what what does rank higher for respondents when they think about good leadership? Integrity, hard work, responsibility, commitment, resilience, trustworthiness. 
Um, these were, were all very high, along with some key interpersonal skills. Communication, unsurprisingly, was high up there. And a measure of competence was um, identified very highly across sectors. That was sometimes simply stated in terms of competence in some sectors, um, such as financial services. There was a real emphasis on risk awareness, and that came in at the very top there. So I think there was some measure of competence, interpersonal skills and, and character across all of them. But the character domain came up um, particularly highly. We're about to shift to section two, question number two. Can one keep score? How should one? How may one keep score? But before we get there, let's just dive a little bit deeper into the implications here for business. Let's pretend I am the CEO of my own small company. Maybe I'm, well, let's let's take your dad, an entrepreneur of, of vintage, somebody who's working hard, doing something they love, hoping that someone will buy their product or service. What advice would you have for the, let's go with the average business owner? Uh, across the world in terms of what they could do to deploy some of your learnings within their own framework. We're all operating from many different contexts, Ed Brooks, but what what can I learn as an entrepreneur that I could or should be doing better either for myself or for my people or enterprise? Excellent. And I think um, I'd go straight to role modeling. And this is what you could do for yourself and for your enterprise. So repeatedly in our course of research, Role modeling has come up very, very highly in terms of the impact of leaders on others in the organization and on the culture as a whole. And so if you're concerned to advance and see the value of advancing um, good character in your organization, and I think there's really important reason to do that. And some of our research has measured the impact or looked at um, reviewed research on the impact of character in um, organizational life and leadership. And, and it's, um, um, it's, it's clear then thinking about well, what example is being set to, to others around um, as human beings. We learn by example. Uh, we follow examples. We look up to, um, to others as models. What's that example that, that's being set and how can others follow it? Excellent and completely persuasive. Thank you, role modeling. We're all doing it all the time, whether or not we realize it, being conscious of what we show to other people, being conscious of how they will react to the things that they see that we say and do is profoundly important. And I do appreciate some of your earlier points going back to rugby about deliberate practice, about an earlier theme in our conversation today. Uh, In a sense, virtue or good character is about performance. It's a performance art. It's not a high-minded, ethereal thing that sits up in our gray matter somewhere. It's about what you're about to say or do and how it affects the world around you. Role modeling. Thank you, Ed Brooks. Let's move on then to our next section, keeping score. Now, I let off the previous section by saying, Henry Cloud says, or I say character always wins, does it? So I'm going to go with a similar approach here. I'm going to go with a classic line that I know you've heard before. I'm not sure who said it, but man, does this drive a lot of leadership and evaluation and appraisal in our world today. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Now, that's an entire school of thinking. I'm sure there's a counter school of different thinking, but let's stick with that straight up aphorism. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. First of all, Ed Brooks, do you agree with that sentiment? Are you within that school or do you identify with a different school? So I think that school presupposes certain things about measuring and the reason for measuring related to the kind of idea that, that management is. And here, um, character you know, operates on a different logic, perhaps, to the idea of, um, of management that we're, that we're talking about in a technical sense. But coming back to can character be measured? And um, you know, what I do like in that uh, aphorism is that, yes, look, if things are important, we should expect them um, to, to show up and we should look for them and try to encourage and cultivate them. And so I think character can be measured, yes, but not in the same way as, say, the value of a stock. Um, so um, we need to think about the kind of measurement um, that fits the idea or the thing that we're looking to uh, measure. And this is... Um, kind of controversial in this space and so some people might say no character is part of the set of things which are just absolutely beyond measurement um and trying to measure character will necessarily corrupt it you know we kind of instrumentalize character by focusing on the effect of the impact of character 
brings it into some pseudoscientific paradigm that's at odds with what character is really about. Well, I think, yes, okay, a certain kind of focus on measurement can detract from the idea that character is importantly internal. It's about our motivations as well as our um, actions and that character is its own reward. It's not for the sake of something else. But maybe we can think mm. about character measurement diff differently. And this is actually, I think, where the idea of keeping score is, is quite a useful analogy um, when it comes to, to character um, development. So um, keeping score suggests the idea of tracking progress towards a goal. Um, score is what, you, um, what, you, what you're looking at when you're in the game it, itself. So I know there's been some, some golf on over the last few days and uh, Europe were playing <laughs> against um, the USA in the Ryder Cup. And Yes, I do believe Europe won yet again. <laughs> so as, as they went through each of those matches, there was a score within the match. Yeah, and that would have been very important that they were keeping as they were going through the match. But as soon as each match ends, then that score is tallied up into the overall um, score of the matches. And as soon as those matches have, end, have ended, that result uh, is what stands. And we just said, you know, Europe, OK, what beat the, the USA on, on this occasion <laughs> um, at, the final, at the final whistle at the, the last analysis. So the keeping score is what you're doing as you're going along in order to measure your progress towards the ultimate goal, which is, which is winning the game. And we do need to do that, I think. The idea of tracking progress is very, very important when it comes, very relevant when it comes to character, because character isn't binary. Character isn't about you have good character or you don't have good character. It's not about win or loss. It's about the developmental journey. It's about a growing as a human being, uh, these important qualities of justice, courage, patience, generosity, love, humility. We can keep going over our lifetime so that we live well in ourselves, that we're the best versions of ourselves and that we contribute to those others around us in our communities, our organizations and in the world at large. We are living in an age of measurement. We almost can't not be doing so. A lot of us are counting our caloric intake or we're tracking the number of website clicks we got. How many downloads did I get for this podcast? Um, the amount of data in our world today is no doubt at an all-time high. I suppose you could say it's always existed. It's only just that we started to care, notice, and track it and toward progress. Most of the time, we're only looking at data when we care, when we see some purpose toward ca capturing those numbers and then seeing what plays out over time. I was reminded by a friend that a few centuries ago, it was very alien to have this mentality. Very little was being counted uh, in the way that we almost take for granted today. So I'm curious whether you think artificial intelligence might in some way enable us or whether present data tracking systems might already be in some senses enabling human character. I posit, I don't think anybody's done this or this would be hard to track, but I posit that if I could look over a hundred individuals and look at a rolling five-year period, the last five years of how many lies each one has told, I bet if I found my top decile of non-liars, I bet that they would be more successful, happier, and more productive citizens than the bottom decile. The problem is nobody's tracking that so far as I can tell. We can track ourselves, which is important, but is this fair? Is this too simple-minded, Ed Brooks, that if you simply count the number of virtues, vices, uh, great things, transgressions, and we use that data and started to incorporate it into the decisions that we make and the actions that we take, in my mind, that's a better world. But so far as I can tell, no one's really keeping score when it comes to virtue performance. Am I right? So I think people are starting to keep score in the way that you're talking about at a macro level. But I think there are different reasons for different people to keep score here. So we might think there's a personal reason to keep score. So if your character is really important to you, then I guess it's important to reflect on your experience to keep account um, for yourself. How are you doing? How are you growing? What's your own score? And there are some wonderful examples um, of that. Benjamin Franklin has this brilliant uh, example of his own practice of keeping track or keeping score of 12 virtues, which he uh, defined for, for himself. And it's there in his autobiography as he uh, went through and would put a star in, in each day when he hadn't quite um, lived up to his expectations when it came to that particular virtue. 
And he did this over. Isn't a, that wonderful? Self scoring. I love it. Self scoring. And, and this is important. If something's important to us, we should be seeking to grow. And if, how do you know if you're growing unless you're taking seriously some kind of practice of introspection and uh, evaluation? So there's, there's a personal reason. And you can bring others into that as well. There's uh, interpersonal ways of then you know, bringing others in, recruiting others for your project. And companies even do this with the kinds of 360 degree feedback sometimes. Sometimes this relates to. Um, just the kind of technical aspects of performance, but it can relate to aspects of character as well. And this doesn't always work so well, but at its best, it can give some useful ideas of uh, the ways I'm thinking I am showing up, the ways that others are seeing me and receiving the contribution I'm making. I think in the bigger picture though that we're talking about, this kind of systematic and more scientific process of measurement and using AI in large language models, I think this is just something that people are just starting to, to explore and has some interesting possibilities. Uh, certainly, um, some colleagues have just put out a, an article um, from Munich looking at glass door data and trying to look for evidence of intellectual vice, that is to say, uh, ways of thinking which are detrimental to um, the identification hmm. of truth. And then thinking of and correlating that perhaps to organizational um, performance would be a, a step you might uh, you might take. So I think there are ways to start to think. Now we have the kinds of data available to us as to how we might go about looking and identifying you know, the fruits of character as they're exp- it's expressed in, in different ways in different um, different data sets, and then thinking about how that relates to uh, some of the things that are important uh, to us in one domain or um, or another. It's just at the beginning. Um, there's lots of possibility here, but there are dangers um, as well. Certainly. You can jump too quickly from looking for you know, the fruit of a certain kind of virtue or vice to you know, thinking that we understand perhaps more than we do from the data that we um, the data that we have. But there's all kinds of possibility emerging with large uh, amounts of data and with AI. Another danger of perhaps too quickly jumping to conclusion, scoring inadequately, not watching enough of the game, having a small sample size, and having a knee jerk reaction. Um, a lot of people, at least in on this side of the pond, I won't speak to yours, you, you can, uh, have talked about cancel culture in the last five or 10 years. This idea that somebody who's done something wrong is publicly shamed, social media a big weapon in this regard, being turned into a weapon. It can also be a weapon for good, but bad in this case. I'm curious any views you might have on so-called cancel culture why it occurs, whether it's always been there and we're just giving it a name right now and it's enjoying a brief faddish uh, focus or or whether there's something real here that we should learn from. I think this area is very complicated and it's certainly something which is uh, central to debate in universities, which have historically been places where people uh, weren't cancelled and ideas were um, considered openly and analysed in terms of the best uh, evidence available in support of them. And um, that evidence was then presented publicly disputed. And so we could find um, out the, the truth of the, the matter. And so the idea of cancelling uh, people uh, for one reason or another is something we should be perhaps cautious about. And universities, certainly in the UK, have been very cautious um, about. I think there is a wider social phenomenon here. And there are certainly um, ways in which uh, ideas of a human identity being um, cultivated as we're thinking and identified, self-identified as we're thinking about them today, um, do make different ideas and interpretations very challenging. Uh, and so we do need to think about how we can navigate, uh, how we can navigate that and how we can continue to engage well with people who have radically different views. I have to say we have some experience here of, of helping students to um, identify um, views on controversial points and then speaking to their colleagues and peers about the views they disagree with. And when we've done that in programs, it's been incredibly effective and students have really really, really welcomed the opportunity for discussion with people that they are already working with on shared projects and then find out they actually have very different views on one thing or um, or another. Well, Ed, we're about to move on to discussing how we can grow in character. How can I up my game? But before we do that, it occurs to me you're sitting there at Oxford University and I end up asking myself rapscallion questions like, how do we know if a university is succeeding? Um, I, I can't imagine Oxford is not. It's one of the foremost educational institutions in the world today and in world history too, I should say. But as someone who focuses on leadership and, and on human flourishing, 
do you find measures are are there measures that you can apply to your university or that I could apply to mine? So I think there are ways of focusing our attention and I think measurement approaches here can help us to do that really well. Um, so even if they're not absolute, there's an important um, point to be made in that the um, measure what you treasure idea that I think you mentioned earlier on. If we start to focus our some measurement on this domain of this area of, of character, perhaps we'll then be focused a bit more intentionally on the cultivation of it. Of course, it's hard to measure the impact of any educational um, institution. It's measured ultimately in um, the people who, who come through it and the ideas that are developed within it and the value of those ideas and what's produced by them. And we're always looking for different proxies, I think, to, to attach to some of these um, outcomes. We might measure the number of companies that were spun out of a university or the investment from mm. um, from people outside the university into the university as a value in society of the research and the ideas that, that are there or the um, the careers that students go on um, to uh, to occupy and, and the ways in which they make a difference in the world. We can look at all of these things. We can look at character using mixed methods approaches and so character has this important motivational component so we need to ask people about their motivations in order to try to assess that uh, that well and there are um, good measures um, psychometric measures which are called self-report measures focusing on particular character qualities or on character as a whole and there's a, a brilliant uh, work going on at harvard university and the human flourishing program led there by tyler van, van der Weel. And they've got a, a human flourishing scale, which has character as one of the components. And they've got one question, which is, I think, just brilliant. And it's a, a character question, which is predictive then of, of many other domains of, of human flourishing. And, and the question is this, I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging situations. And there's a question you could ask to yourself, ask to others and rank yourself over time reflectively. And you could have some idea of what is their character growth going on, me personally, in a population more, more broadly. Of course, the more people you have, you can start to evaluate some trends. And we can apply these kinds of measures in um, educational contexts as well, along with qualitative measures, talking to people, asking what they valued from their experiences in the educational institution or in the um, development program in the, in the company, and seeing if that relates to our intention in the beginning. Uh, maybe aspects of there are surprising. They're saying something they value, which wasn't actually you know, kind of set front and center in the design. Uh, and maybe that's something which we might then think about um, you know, making more of, or maybe they're not getting as much out of it as we might think as instructors from our perspective. And so that's important to do as well. And I think we can focus here on, on different domains. We can focus on uh, intellectual growth, cognitive de development, but we can also focus on dispositional outcomes and character development. And I think we, we should do, we ought to. Mm. How do you score the Oxford Character Project? One way to score it is it's going, still going. You started this 10 years ago. That's, that's how I think about this podcast. I'm still going every week into my ninth year. That's one way of scoring. But Ed, how do you score your own work? That's a great, a great question. And I think part of it is, um, are we adding value? And are the same that we're adding value to them personally through different programs that we run and to their work through the research that that we're doing and so we're, we're looking for others i think in the responses we receive so actually yeah look that piece of research is helping us in this uh, in this way and what we've done with it is this and we've developed it in some direction and taken it taking it further and so we try to look out for that and we will keep track when um organizations outside of the university are, are using and relying on our research and, and what they're doing with it and we will um keep in touch with our students and ask about their experience they finished but their ongoing experience as well now what we were able to do with them here at the university is set them up. So we try to try to do that. And um, I think always, I don't know how about you, but, but here we're kind of critical of our work. We think there's more that we could be, um, could be doing. But it is amazing to have this opportunity and to be here over the last 10 years and still here with this, uh, this great opportunity. And each year, new groups of incredible um, people coming through. And congratulations. I first met you in person at our mutual friend's house, Grace and Peter Bond. But my daughter, Kate, as I mentioned at the top, uh, had just a fantastic time with you just a few days in Oxford a few years ago. So um, I, can, I can clearly report that my friends and family, all of whom have been in and around you and your project, have all felt well served. And I do trust that the time we're spending this week is reaching 
many. Let's move on now, Ed, to our final section. Actually, headline, it's not our final section because Ed has consented to playing buy, sell, or hold at the end of this conversation. But let's go into this final main topic, upping your game. How can we grow in character? Now, Ed, I do believe you might be working on a book. I think you might be. And I don't know if you're one of those authors who likes to talk about his book ahead of time or not at all. But I tend to latch on to numbers. A lot of us do this. So I think I think the number seven seems relevant to your coming book. Would you describe briefly how you think we can grow in character in seven steps or less? I'd love to. I'll give you seven very quickly and three maybe with a, a little bit more of a focus because seven's quite a lot and we haven't got much time. But I am working on a book, Seven Ways to Grow in Character with a great friend and colleague, Michael Lamb, who leads the program for leadership and character at Wake Forest. And the, the seven strategies which we've used and applied in our own work over the last, uh, the last decade are these. One, habituation through practice. Two, reflection on experience. Three, engagement with virtuous exemplars or role models. Four, virtue literacy, so learning the language of character and virtues. Five, awareness of situational variables, how we're squeezed, pressured, shaped by uh, different aspects of the world around us, for better and sometimes for worse. Six, more reminders that remind us of our um, commitments to ourselves and to others and friendships of mutual accountability. And the three I might emphasize particularly are these, habituation, role models, and friendship. Um, and maybe we could spend a tiny bit more time on these three, if, um, if that sounds good to you. Please do. G- give us the short course in, in those three, one at a time. So habituation through practice. And here the key idea is that we become what we repeatedly do. So virtues are habits, and they're developed in a way which um, is analogous to skills. And this is an insight from Julia Anas, a, a prominent philosopher who's written a brilliant book called Intelligent Virtue, and describes how we could think about virtues um, like we might think about the intentional an expert practice needed to develop, say, a reliable um, tennis um, swing, backhand, forehand, um, as you like. Um, we need to think about what the, the virtue is. Say the virtue is of integrity. Well, how are we applying that virtue, um, being true to our deep commitments in different ways? And what does that mean and look like? And there's some reflection needed there and then some intentional practice. So I will um, speak um, in the call with my um my deepest commitments in the meetings that I go to and analysis that I'm, that I'm doing that even when, you know, I don't necessarily feel that um, that's an easy thing to, to do. And by continually practicing that over the time, identifying what the um, particular way of practicing looks like in your context by repeated practice, uh, there's a way to grow, become what we repeatedly do. And I think this is something that the Benjamin Franklin was onto in that approach we looked at earlier, identifying the 12 virtues, uh, identifying what that meant for him, and he did that very specifically for each one, and then practicing that every day, every day, every day. Others have taken it further too. Ben Horowitz is a, a leading venture capitalist um, and co-founder of this amazing firm, Andreessen Horowitz, which you know. And he's also a best-selling management author, and he takes this approach up in, in the book, What You Do Is Who You Are, How to Create Your Business Culture, which draws on, uh, in his work, the samurai approach, which is all about the same idea of habituation and he draws a distinction between values which are important commitments and virtues which are practiced developed over time so that's the first one habituation through practice thank you yeah the the second is role models and here the idea is of engaging with virtuous exemplars and doing that intentionally so thinking about the people we look up to what is it that makes them admirable uh, how can we relate to them? Where's there an overlap between their world and my world such that I can follow after them in my own way, in my own style, but still uh, look up to them and um, follow them um, in the way in which they exhibit um, good character? Um, so there's the the overlap of, of experience, but also important to think about role models, not as people we put on pedestals, but as attainable. And, and here there's some good research showing that it's these features of admiration uh, relevance and attainability, which make for the most powerful uh, role models in terms of our moral development. And so rather than looking up to people from a distance, actually trying to get close to them and thinking closely about their failures as well as their uh, victories and strengths, the ways that they were developing, the way that they overcame difficulties um, and challenges and still try to do that. So that's role models, engaging with virtuous exemplars and doing that actively. And we can do that so easily with um, the amazing biographies that we have around us or biopics on film or by 
talking to people and asking them that we look up to about how they do things, what they do, why they do them, um, and we can learn and grow. I've watched a lot of sport in my life, and part of the justification I've given myself for having indulged as much as I have as a spectator of usually popular American sports is that often I had a child near me, maybe sitting on my lap at home watching on TV, maybe sitting next to me at the stadium. And as one thing or another happened and people cheered or booed, it occurred to me that these are each little opportunities to teach. Why did that happen? Why are we reacting this way? And so almost anything, it seems like, can be picked up and played with as a toy to encourage virtue and discourage vice. So uh, there's a justification for all my fellow sports fans as well. Absolutely. And it's the intentionality that you talk about that's absolutely, absolutely key ah, here. Yeah. All right. And your third one? The third one is friendship. And here there's um, a beautiful way in the classical world in which friendship was parsed into three types, friends of pleasure, utility, and virtue. And it's the third type that's going to be most important for us. But the other two are important as well. It's about discerning what type of friendship is here and how friends then can help us to grow in character. So the first kind of a friendship that the classical world discerned was friends of pleasure. And here it might be friends we enjoy a shared pastime with, going to the um, football match or the um, concert. Uh, friends of utility are the second kind. And these may be like LinkedIn connections or, or network connections in business. And there's a recipro reciprocity uh, that goes on here in uh, these kinds of uh, friendships. And this is good. This is helpful and this is important. Um, but the deepest kinds of friendship that was talked about in the, in the classical world was a friendship of virtue. And here is a friendship for the sake of the other and not just for the sake of the other in the material domain, but for the sake of the other's best interest in terms of who they are as a human being. And of course, in order to have friends of virtue, we can't have so many of them because you need to know uh, each other really well. And it's costly too, uh, because sometimes uh, it'll take you into places and saying things which might be maybe more difficult to um, say in terms of challenging someone to live up to themselves and their best lights. Uh, there's a brilliant example here in a letter from Clementine Churchill to Winston Churchill, which we always share with, with students in our, our programs. And it's a lovely letter. It was in June 1940, France had been lost to German forces, the Brits had evacuated, and Winston Churchill was taking strain. And his wife, Clementine, writes to him and says, one of the men in your entourage has noticed Winston and has had a word to me that you're becoming you know, rough, he says, sarcastic and overbearing in your manner. And Clementine says, and actually, I've noticed that you're not as kind as you used to be. And she said she, hmm. she, she writes this out and she writes the letter to him saying she'd, she'd written it several times before and ripped it up, but she was writing to him because she, she knew he needed to to know and she called him to kind of live by his best lights and she referenced this saying uh, in French on the reine sur les âmes que par le calme which is you, you only reign, reign over, rule over hearts by, by calmness and this was something that Winston Churchill held very dear and she reminded him of this you know this is what you say you're about this is deep and important to you and it's important that you live up to that and then she, she drew off the letter at the end uh, with signing it then this picture of a cat um, which was a kind of in-joke between the two of them but also a kind of sign of affection love devotion uh, that enables, I guess, the, the medicine to, to go down well. You know, you, if you challenge to someone you don't know so well or in the wrong way, in this kind of way, then it's not going to help them to, to grow in a character. It could have an adverse reaction, of course. So friends of virtue, how can we cultivate those kinds of friendship um, to, in order to help us grow? So those are the three, uh, three ways, perhaps, to up your character game, work on habituation role models and cultivate friendships of virtue. Well, I'm looking forward to the book that you and Michael will produce. Thank you in the meantime for a pray see and a focus on a few of the things that each of us can take away from this conversation this week. I especially appreciate those three types of friendship and just being intentional and thinking about how we're interacting with those around us and who really means something to us and what are the implications of recognizing deeper relationship with others. Well, we're about to close with buy, sell, or hold, Ed, but it occurs to me that I should ask, how could somebody get in touch with you if they would like to learn more about the project. Um, how can we reach you? Do you have an email, the website? If I listen this week and I really would love to go deeper with you, maybe you could partner with me at some point, my organization here or abroad. How do we get in touch with Ed Brooks? Thanks, David. Um, like many academics, I'm quite easy to get in touch with. So you can find me through the Oxford University website or our oxfordcharacterproject.org website or via LinkedIn. And we'd be delighted to hear from any of the listeners out there and to, um, to be in contact.
All right, Ed Brooks, let's play buy, sell, or hold. I'll be throwing out things to you and asking you, these are not stocks, but if they were, would you be buying today, selling, or holding, and why? And let's start it off with the human race. The human race. Don't tell me I'm not ambitious with this game. The human race, Ed Brooks, buy, sell, or hold? Buy. Um, big time buy. So I um, am firmly committed to the idea of, of human goodness, uh, a deep human goodness of human dignity, and of that being something which is very precious and needs to be cultivated by individuals and then by um, by societies. And I think that's something which is very, very important. Always buy and um, don't just buy and hold, but buy and grow. Love it. You know, one of the things that I've done as a small practice myself for more than 10 years is I randomize from a list of virtues that I've just built up over the years. I was inspired as a young person by Benjamin Franklin and what he did, so I'm so glad you made light of that. So I have my 36 virtues, and each day I wake up and I randomize one of them, and I think about it throughout the day. I try to act on it, and then at the end of the day, I try to reflect on it. And the one that came to me today of our conversation happens to be empathy. And I want to briefly interrupt this game by asking you a little bit more about empathy. There have been books written in recent times, Jeremy Rifkin's book, The Empathic Civilization, that advocate, and they're actually trying to measure empathy. They're actually trying to score this. And Rifkin asserts that we actually have more empathy today than at any point in human history. And he tracks it kind of like a stock graph from lower left to upper Right. So empathy is my virtue of the day, but any quick thoughts about empathy for our fellow human beings? So empathy is so important today because we come into contact with so many people who are so different from us. The world is smaller than it's it's ever been. We are always meeting people from different backgrounds, different places with different stories and life experiences. And empathy is the virtue of character, which um, takes a pause and helps us to see things through their eyes Um, and that is going to be very very important in order for us to get on well in our communities and society and in particular these days we often think that it's on the decline or is it even there at all we hear about the political divisions we hear about the use of contempt in public spheres and space to minimize uh, others that don't agree with us. And I recognize that all those things are happening in, in our society, but what is also happening in our society is much more accord and respect for women, far more than it existed at many points in history. It's not true of every country and every neighborhood today, but it sure is far more so than a century ago when women had barely even gotten the vote in many cases um, the way we treat animals. Pets are often members of our family these days. I probably was kicking my dog when I was five, but I love my dog today. So there are lots of signs. And I do believe it's that globalizing force of bumping into people different from us at a rate far more common than I think, again, at any other point in history. We can think about transportation, all kinds of reasons. But what am I doing ranting briefly during buy, sell, or hold? Let's go back to it. Ed Brooks, buy, sell, or hold. Well, he's funded your project. so. You better be at least a little bit bullish. I'm having fun with this. He seems to have been a most honorable man. Buy, sell, or hold the legacy of John Templeton. So I've got to buy um, here, like you say, the John Templeton Foundation, the Templeton World Charity Foundation have been such generous supporters. Our work would not exist without them. Um, I never knew that the, the founder and philanthropist of this amazing legacy, what I do know is that the uh, legacy that has been built on his philanthropy and the work that's being supported around the world. And the um, group of Templeton Foundations have been amazing supporters of character, education, development, as well as many other um, areas as well, but this one in, in particular. And we're really grateful for for their support of us. I thought you'd be bullish, but it's good to hear a little bit more about what was, I think, a truly great man, a man who was not only successful in business and as an investor, but as I've often said, I think some of the most successful investors are people of real character, like Warren Buffett, another quick example comes to mind. I think to really truly be excellent at recognizing in others what will grow and rise over time and recognizing what the world needs, you need to have some inner eye yourself, which can discern and recognize Uh, goodness around you. And I think John Templeton is certainly one example. What in particular, I know you never knew the man, but Ed, what in particular has come to you as a a strength, a character strength that John Templeton exemplified? 
So I think the I'm impressed by his the the kind of entrepreneurial nature of his um, of his work, and his maybe it's we started with his commitment to, to human goodness and wanting to see that flourish across different areas of life, and and to that a bit of commitment to truth. So he was never afraid of big questions. In fact, um, still the John Templeton Foundation works around this idea of, of big questions, which can try to get to the heart of the truth of, of the matter and of reality and of human experience, how we might do that and of using you know, the best scientific methods in different ways in order to, to understand who we are, how our world works, and how it works in, in all kinds of different uh, different levels, at the kind of material level through scientific inquiry, through spiritual inquiry as well. And uh, he applies that across the different domains. And that, I think that comes out of this, uh, this man, his entrepreneurial instincts and his appetite for um, for knowledge across domains out of this wonder and um, appreciation of what it means to be human. Buy, sell, or hold punctuality as a meaningful and important aspect of human character is, in so many words, Ed, is punctuality a virtue? Buy, sell, or hold punctuality being on the Mount Rushmore or near it of human virtue? I'm going to hold. We do have some German listeners, by the way. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to hold because I'm, we may have also some some listeners from Latin America or from other parts of the world where I mean, the punctu- ideas of punctuality are just quite different. And so I think this is kind of re- you know, relevant and domain specific um, punctuality in certain ways. So yes, sometimes not always. And so I'm on a I'm on a hold here. It's going to be. <laughs> It is a reminder that what we call character, or as you pointed out earlier, good character, what we count as virtues, can be very cultural. Uh, And it's hard in the end to say that there's an objective Plato's wall of his cave view of what human character or good character or virtue is. And uh, I do know some people who hold up punctuality as a virtue that everyone should be practicing and others who don't even think twice about it. And I like both of these people. They're just, they think differently. Absolutely. Ed, is there another semi-ambiguous virtue that you can think of, something that some people seem to care a whole lot about and others are barely aware of? Yes. So living with um, children and teenagers, I think, because think about cleanliness, which (laughs) in in the old saying is held next to godliness, I think, as as a virtue. And yet, um, this doesn't always seem to <laughs> to translate in the um, in the application. So maybe maybe there's an example there. I think there are, there are quite a few examples of where virtues are specific to one culture or another, and I think this is where there are interesting conversations between generations, between um, different um, cultural contexts as well. I agree. We don't have time for it this week, but I think it's quite interesting to think what are the virtues that are clearly and strongly upheld by some in some contexts and not in others. And that list of virtues deserves its own book or research project at some point, because that strikes me as very interesting. It's one thing to say integrity, of course, courage. Yes, why not? Uh, It's another to say punctuality, cleanliness, and I'm sure a laundry list of other uh, nairs do well. All right, let's go to my last one. Ed Brooks, buy, sell, or hold. How could I not ask you this? You may not have a developed sense, but how could I not ask you? Buy, sell, or hold the Oxford comma. So, <laughs> I, I think it's over. It's overdone. We, we really don't, don't need it so often. <laughs> but if you do need the comma in order to make the clarification that the and is referring to something else, the, the, the last call. then then fine put it in but as it going in everywhere i think it looks it looks a little bit scruffy to me so i'm going to sell sell on the oxford comma oh my gosh the only thing we disagreed on the entire hour ed brooks uh this is heresy that you've just visited upon this podcast and from oxford university no less but this is why i had you on ed because i need we need to hear sometimes the counterpoint and you're never afraid to speak your mind ed brooks you've been full of insight and are a bright beacon of hope and promise. Fools everywhere I know, join me in thanking you for your work and wishing you the best. Thank you very much, David. It's been such a joy and pleasure to be with you and uh, all of the listeners. You know, at close, I'm thinking back to Shirzad Shamin, past guest on this show, author of the book, Positive Intelligence, who has a great little speech somewhere about character. He comes at it from a different angle. In a sense, he says, as humans, 
We will never have perfect character. It is indeed our flaws. It is our fallibility that makes us human. Can you imagine, he asks, if you were perfect, if you were perfect, can you imagine how insufferable this would be for your children, how they would measure themselves up against you, always feel like they're failing, all your loved ones and peers too. In fact, were you perfect, you might be in some ways fundamentally unlovable. It is in our fallibility, in my many weaknesses, in yours, that we are human to each other. It's what causes us to empathize, love, and relate. But in no way does this beauty in a sense of human fallibility suggest that we should not endeavor to become better, to strive to be more virtuous. That too is admirable, and in Ed Brooks's words, that is role modeling and helpful. Or, in Arthur Brooks's words, channeling Oprah a few weeks ago on this podcast, another Brooks? Too many Brookses? In Arthur's and Oprah's words, in the same way we will never be perfect, we will never be happy. There is no finished, perfect state of happiness. We should seek happierness, progression toward more happy, toward more virtue, with a concomitant effort as well to reduce unhappiness and reduce vice. And so we are left with the Motley Fool's credo, then too, which all interrelates towards smarter, happier, and richer. We celebrate the er. We celebrate the er, which also happens to be the last two letters of the word we focused on this week. Character er, the mark, the imprint that you leave on others. And this world, as Ed gave us the etymology, character. Full on. As always, people on this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about. And The Molly Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Learn more about Rule Breaker Investing at rbi.fool.com.